I'm Beth Ann Patrick. I'm a literary critic and book reviewer and a journalist. I live here in the DC area and I write primarily these days for the LA Times, but I also have a book that's a memoir about depression coming out next May. And so I'm particularly invested in what we're going to hear today from our two author guests. Really excited to hear. Um, I tweet as the book maven, and so if you want to find me, that's where you can go. And enough about me. Unfortunately, I'm still echoing. I'm sorry, I don't know what to do about that. But I'd like to introduce our two panelists, and I'll go autobi uh, alphabetically, not autobiographically. Rachel Aviv, to my immediate um, right, is a staff writer at The New Yorker, where she writes about medicine, education, criminal justice, and other subjects. In 2022, she won a National Magazine Award, which is a big deal, for profile writing. A 2019 National Fellow at New America, she lives in Brooklyn, Aviv received a Whiting Creative Nonfiction Grant to support her work on her book, Strangers to Ourselves, Unsettled Minds and the Stories that Make Us External. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. Next is Daniel Bergner, who is a contributing writer for the New York Times Magazine, also no slouch, and the author of many books of nonfiction, including the best-selling Sing for Your Life, What Do Women Want, The Other Side of Desire, In the Land of Magic Soldiers, and God of the Rodeo. His writing has appeared in many magazines, including The Atlantic, Harper's, Mother Jones, and of course, the New York Times Book Review. Featured today is Dan, Daniel Bergner's latest book, The Mind and the Moon, My Brother's Story, The Science of Our Brains, and The Search for Our Psyches External, which explores patients of mental illness and their experiences with treatments and reflects on how society cares for the mind scientifically and spiritually. So welcome to both of you with my echo going on. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks so much. And the first thing I'm going to ask, I have lots of questions for the authors, but I'm going to ask each of you to tell us the elevator pitch for your book. So very quick um, elevator pitch and then a very quick reading to give us a taste about what your writing is like before we dive into the questions. And I will start with you, Rachel, please. Okay, I should just say that, and oh, no, I'm not going to. Um, I, the elevator pitch is like, the hardest part for me because I feel like uh, the book is hard to cleanly describe, but it tells the story of people in different cultures and in different historical eras who feel as if they've kind of reached the limits of psychiatric explanations for who they are um, and feel, and it's about the way that kind of expert explanations of mental disorders um, sort of interact with the person who is being diagnosed that way and, and potentially changes their sense of self and, and their sense of how their life will unfold. I think that's a pretty good elevator pitch. Well done. And would you read, please? OK, and I'm just reading the first three paragraphs of the book, which are about my own experience. Um, it goes on to describe how, when I was six, I stopped eating and was hospitalized for six weeks for anorexia and sort of learned what anorexia was by watching older girls uh, around me. Um, and we'll talk more about that. Yeah, later. okay. In the early weeks of first grade, I made a friend named Elizabeth. She was the oldest child in our class, but tiny with thin, knobby limbs. We connected over the game Moncala dropping marbles into a wooden board with 14 shallow holes. I avoided other classmates so I'd be ready when Elizabeth asked me to play. Sometimes, somehow she always did. I felt that I had willed our friendship into being. I asked my mom why Elizabeth's house in Bloomfield Hills, a wealthy suburb of Detroit, smelled so different from ours. I was disappointed that her answer, laundry detergent, felt so ordinary. Elizabeth's house was so large that I was sure she got lost in it. 
She had a yellow canopy bed, a walk-in closet, a swimming pool. She showed me how when she brushed her blonde hair, it got even lighter. Her family had a refrigerator in their basement devoted just to sodas, and one day Elizabeth proposed that we feed Coke to our knees. We tried the experiment in her babysitter's car and laughed as Coke dripped onto the seats. It seemed incredible that there was only one way to drink. At home, I sometimes pretended I was Elizabeth. I walked into rooms and imagined I didn't know where they led. It seemed like a fluke, a bit of bad luck, that I had been born as me rather than as Elizabeth. I remember waking up forlorn after a dream. I was given the chance to become Elizabeth if I picked the right seat on the school bus. I walked past 13 rows, overwhelmed by the opportunity, and chose the wrong seat. Thank you, thank you so much. Absolutely. Daniel, the mind and the moon. So I have to follow that poetry with an elevator pitch. <laughs> that doesn't seem fair. But um, you get to read. <laughs> so, uh, see, my book starts uh, with my younger brother. When we were in our early 20s, he was diagnosed as very severely bipolar, uh, hospitalized, put on locked ward, and our terrified parents were told that if he didn't adhere to his medication, uh, that he might well take his own life. So the book begins there, tells his story, and asks what I hope are some really important questions about the way we think about our psyches and ourselves, and the uh, pretty obdurate obstacles, maybe dead ends, that conventional psych psychiatry has run into in terms of understanding and treating our psyches. Um, but that said, I'm going to take a little detour in reading. Uh, the book opens with my brother and then also in parallel tells the story of a woman named Caroline. So I'm just going to read to you a couple paragraphs about Caroline. Caroline was living in a group home when her picture went up on billboards around Asheville, North Carolina. It was strange for her to consider this abrupt bit of fame, but suddenly she was a star on the city's flat track roller derby team, and in the packed Civic Center, mothers leaned at the rails with programs for her to autograph and gratitude to proclaim. They said they wanted their daughters to be just like her, they seemed to perceive in her pint-sized being an outsized strength. This made everything all the more bewildering because she, who was scribbling her name across her photo in the programs, who was glancing up at the billboards from the bicycle that got her from here to there, or looking up from the back of the group home van that took the residents to the appointments and volunteer jobs that were supposed to scaffold their lives, was perpetually hearing voices, hearing people who weren't standing in front of her or looming behind her shoulder, who didn't exist, not in the way most people define existence, but who were perfectly real to her, yelling, whispering, wailing, warning, commanding, beseeching, berating, and not infrequently instructing her to kill herself. She was in her late 20s, Abilify, Risperdal, Depakote, Lithium, Seroquel. The staff at the group home believed she was still taking her medications. Thank you so much, Daniel. That last sentence is quite the kicker. And one of the things we need to talk about today, and one of the things I'm sure many of you in the audience are aware of, is that there is such stigma around any form of mental illness, whether it is something that happens to a child, whether it's something that happens to a woman in her 20s, or to a family member, the stigma can be, let's not talk about it, the stigma can be as important as let's not treat it. 
And there's also the question in both your books about what are the limits of treatment. And so let's talk a little bit about why broken, so-called broken brains terrify us. And either one of you can respond, but I'd love to hear from you both. Um, well, I, I, I guess even the idea of that phrase, well, that phrase is terrifying, and I don't think that phrase is true. Like, the, a brain is not broken, and I think that, you know, being told that your brain is broken or being told that you have a chemical imbalance or that you have a brain disorder, like, I think can be a powerful thing to internalize. Um, and one of the, you know, there has been this big emphasis to think of us, a mental illness as a brain disorder. And the idea is that if you do that, it kind of destigmatizes because it makes it seem like it's not your mother's fault, it's, it's your biology and it's sort of chance, like it, it's out of your control, it's out of everyone's control. Um, but I think like there has been a, this embrace of this idea that sort of overlooks the problem that if you're told that you have this brain disease, like you've been struck by lightning, then it feels like it is out of your control and you can't get rid of it. Um, and like studies of stigma actually show that this model hasn't actually alleviated stigma in part because people start to feel like they have this like catastrophic life sentence and that they can't do anything about it. Um, so the original question, why is a broken brain so terrifying? It, yes. And a so-called, that, that's why. It, it yeah. is terrifying, but I don't, I don't know that it should be, I think it, like if it's framed more as a sort of crisis, like a mental crisis that's a response to sort of environment too, but that can be treated medically, that might be less terrifying. I think we're moving toward neurodiversity as a term that's used more, but I know for myself um, in being treated for depression earlier in my life all the way up to a recent diagnosis that was life-changing, that's something that was so comforting for family and friends to think, oh, it's not her character, mm -hmm. it's this brain, yeah. you know, kind of thing. So how does that relate to the mind and the moon, Daniel? Very much. I mean, my mind is going in all sorts of directions right now because it relates in all sorts of ways. So um, first of all, I'd say that, yes, there was this idea that by medicalizing the way we think about our minds and our uh, psychiatric conditions, that we were somehow relieving stigma. And in some ways, that was true. but. Um, as Rachel's saying, in, in some ways, perhaps very much not. And so, for my brother, um, it was not true. Uh, he wanted out from under the weight of conventional psychiatry's definitions mm -hmm. and limits and prognosis. And um, he went through quite a lot, including being homeless, but there's this moment in my book where I just let him speak about that time and he said to me, you know, you might have seen me, an outsider would have seen me lining up for that free dinner in the church basement and sleeping in that homeless shelter as he put it, forgive the language, you're fucked, you're fucked, you're fucked, but I didn't feel that way because I had decided that I was gonna somehow get out from under this. I wanted to write a different narrative for myself. And so a good deal of the book tells of his journey away from that definition. Such an important word, narrative. Uh, you know, we, we are human. We tell ourselves stories in order to live. And we also tell ourselves stories about difficulties with mental challenges and our mental health. And I think your brother's wanting to write something different. That is very much something that I've felt as I've recovered. Not every brain can be soothed, however. Even, you know, use medications, don't use medications. Um, get support from family, don't get support from family. 
in both of your books, we see scenarios, and, and Rachel, I'm particularly thinking of Bapu. Mm -hmm. um, I don't want to give spoilers because I want you to read these books, but I also want to say um, the stories are also different in both books. And in the case of Bapu in India, um, this is a woman who explores a connection to the divine, um, to the exclusion of all else. And there is no, this is not something that can be solved by modern psychiatry. Am I correct in saying that? This was a journey, this was a narrative. And I don't know if its end is good or bad or, or not, but it's very much a journey. I, know, I, I thought a lot about, um, I think there is one way of seeing Bapu's story. She was a mother, a, a mother of young, two young children and a, a wife, um, sort of feeling oppressed in her home um, by the standards put on like wives and mothers at that time in India. Um, and so she would f flee the home and escape and go to these healing temples in the south of India. And when she did that, she felt like she was no longer being judged for being a bad mother, for mm -hmm. being a bad wife. She felt like she found a community and a sense of fellowship and people who sort of valued this incredible talent she had for writing poetry. Um, but I, I guess I also like, I don't think, I think that was also very painful for her because mm -hmm. it separated her from the people she loved. And towards the end of her life, it was almost like there was this insistence that one story had to be true. Either she was, had a mental illness and she needed to be medicated, or she was a saint. Um, there wasn't like a space to say that she did have this like incredible connection with the divine, but also maybe medications like would help her sort of not be so alone, not have to like chase the divine so far that she's like no longer, she's lost her family. This is fascinating to me because it does seem that a much more holistic approach to any of the people the two of you have written about would change their lives and maybe change their narratives. And in some cases, they did find their own way. But what really surprised me, and I don't think it'll surprise anyone in the audience, is that the stories told in these books reflect so many societal ills. And I'm wondering, you know, Daniel, perhaps you could start with that one. Yeah, I just want to come back to something um, which I think needs to be said, although in a way you're saying it, which is that although I do deeply question the default positions of conventional psychiatry mm -hmm. and the heavy emphasis on a medical biological view of our psyches, I don't mean to be preaching against medication right. just against the sort of default assumptions Absolutely. that seem to be uh, so limiting. You know, the circumstances, in a way, psychiatry tried to free us somewhere around the 70s, 80s, I would say, tried to free us of old conventions, as Rachel mentioned, you know, terrible mothering leads to schizophrenia. That was an absurd equation. And in doing so, just led us to other uh, conventions that kind of limit our understanding. There seem to be so many circumstances that contribute. Um, just one that's horrifying to contemplate is a set of studies that show that the experience of, these are largely studies done in the UK, that the experience of immigrants, particularly immigrants of color, mm -hmm. has a devastating effect on psychiatric outcomes so that the rates of diagnosed schizophrenia among that population are many times higher than they are in the white population. Now, there could be all kinds of reasons for that, but an inescapable possibility is that the discrimination and alienation itself is contributing. So that's just one of many glaring examples. That, that's so important. And one of the things, be, before we talk a little bit more about the societal ills part I was mentioning is, I believe it's in your book, Daniel, where you talk about how 
psychiatry has changed in so many ways over the decades, but we're still Freudians in our everyday life. It's interesting. That's that's a quote uh, from Peter Kramer, who's yes, wise about saying that we still think kind of in Freudian terms, um, certainly about ideas like the unconscious, uh, et cetera. But we're real, we've really, and I don't know, Rachel, if you'd agree, we, we've very much renounce that way of thinking as a mode of treatment or move yes. very much away from it toward this default position where if I, and I actually did this once with one of the really eminent psychiatric researchers, I said to him, well, what would you do with, with my thoughts? And then I laid out something somewhat religious, which we can come to later. <laughs> yeah. and, uh, he looked at me pretty askance, <laughs> and I, I felt like, you know, if I were a little more vulnerable, I might be one step closer to a medication regimen, which would be, in that case, uh, if you're thinking about things that aren't real, uh, that medication can be pretty severe and have pretty <laughs> devastating side effects. Uh, but um, in any case, I, I do wonder if you agree that we've sort of taken a hard turn away from psychoanalytic ways of thinking. Yeah. Now, I'm thinking, and I, I, forgive me, Rachel, for forgetting the name of the young woman um, who's the third. Laura? Laura. Not, not Laura, who went to Harvard, Laura, um, the young black woman. Oh, Naomi. Naomi. Naomi's story just seemed to me to bring in so many ideas about things that need to change in our society. Mm -hmm. it was how did that feel for you in reporting that, in meeting Naomi, in seeing her story? Uh, the, how did those things come up for you? Uh, well, Naomi was a young teenage mother. Uh, she had four kids before she was um, maybe 22. Mm -hmm. um, and when she had a psychotic break, um, she kind of felt like she was understanding uh, like the injustices of America. Like she felt like, oh, I'm finally understanding what it means to be a black mother raising children in America. Right. And it felt like, like the scales were falling from her eyes and she was sort of realizing like the existential and political and social problems in this world. But then like as she became, you know, increasingly sort of removed from reality and she would try to tell her doctors like, I'm so upset because like I see that my entire life has been shaped by this. They were like, actually you're psychotic, you should take medications. And so it, yes. it was almost like um, she felt invalidated and alienated from medical care because like the thing she was pinpointing as the source of her distress was not being acknowledged. This is exactly where I'm going with the stories both of you tell, that we're not treating a whole person, mm -hmm. we're not actually listening to what's bothering people. We're simply diagnosing and prescribing without, and, and I, using we, of course, for the entire Western medical establishment. Would you agree with that? Is that something that um, feels like a core of the books? I think so. Like the Hearing Voices Movement, which you've written about, is a perfect example. of Right, so Caroline ends up leading a movement, and I hope if you all read the book, um, you'll be as, as moved by that as I was in learning her story and, and in watching her lead this movement. That's very alternative to that default uh, medical approach. Um, but I do think we remain, for the most part, stuck in this place where we are going to see the brain as an organ, that's what we've been told, and we're going to treat it. This is kind of the, one of the kind of craters. We're going to treat it the way we treat diabetes. We're going to, you give insulin for diabetes, you balance things out, you give chemicals for the brain, you balance things out. One of the intriguing problems, one among many, um, is that the brain just doesn't reduce that way. So one of the great psychiatric researchers that I spent time with, because the books are sort of interweaves, my brother's story, Caroline's one other, uh, man's story with the attempts of psychiatric researchers to find better uh, pharmacological solutions. 
And this researcher said to me, look, with any other organ in the body, I can take out a little piece of it, I can often just take out a cell of it, and it's doing what the organ does. Go Google heart cell, it's pumping. That is just not true of the neurons, yeah. the, the cells of the brain. They are not thinking, and this is a, this is beyond orders of magnitude and difference. This is just a fundamental, profound difference that made me start to think, maybe we're thinking about our minds and thus ourselves in a way that's leading us down paths that aren't going to prove um, successful in terms of helping us. Rachel? Well, I'm, I'm thinking about something you said at the beginning about how when you got your diagnosis, it felt very liberating and healing. And I do think like that's important. And, and we just don't know. Like for some people like you, it is liberating and it is an incredible relief. And for some people, it feels like, oh my God, I just got this like diagnosis that's limiting my life. Diminishment, and, yeah. Yeah, and I think there's maybe not as much like humility about like we actually don't know how it's like this this story of the the like chemical imbalance or the broken brain works really well for some people and then it doesn't work well and we actually just don't know which it's sort of unpredictable so like the idea of sort of imposing this on everyone without like knowing their individual circumstances that is the thing that i think can feel um can alienate people it's a you know having learned so much more in the past decade or so about PTSD and CPTSD, which is so much more complex, that's why they call it complex post-traumatic stress disorder, is really fascinating because this is not something you can medicate away. You can use medication for symptoms, um, but you can't simply say we're going to get rid of this. Mm -hmm. um, and I think with, with um, time and knowing that there are going to be questions, I have just one more of my own for the moment, which is you've both taken really deep dives into this and we you know, have a certain rapport in talking about these things because all three of us have experienced these worlds, we know about them, but what books haven't been written? What books do we need to see? Is that a fair question? It's a hard question. I'm going to let Rachel. I think it is a hard first. one. Um, I do. I just don't think, I remember reading uh, The Center Cannot Hold by Ellen Sachs. Mm -hmm. It's this memoir about her uh, early years of schizophrenia. And I remember thinking, oh, I had no idea like what the texture of schizophrenia, like what it feels like to be schizophrenic, like sort of the thoughts you're having, the the kind of disorientation. And I feel like more, so many of the experiences of mental illness feel like they're impossible to describe or to communicate. And I think like that alone makes people feel alienated and sort of foreign and unhuman. Yes. And I think so like more books that really try to describe like the actual subjective experience of mental illness can make can do a lot of that work of like making someone feel like, oh, I'm not the only person in the world who is having these very strange experiences. Yes, and, and there are definitely some excellent ones, but there can never be too many, which is ironic for me because in writing a depression memoir, I mean, it feels like a joke every time I tell someone that, you know, oh yeah, another depression memoir, but that is why I wanted to write it for that very reason. Um. I think that's a really wise answer that Rachel just gave about crossing those boundaries between our subjective experiences. So difficult, particularly with people who've been diagnosed with psychosis and you're actually, I'm gonna take a vow right here. So I have a, a young man uh, in the South who's been writing to me and just sent me part of his novel. He's a uh, diagnosed schizophrenic. And I thought when I read the first chapter, I thought, if just with some editing, I bet I could make this work. And I've been reluctant to put in that effort, but Rachel, I'm motivated by you. I'm gonna go home. Do it. Do it. Because he really do does it. take us inside, where I think a book like Ellen's just doesn't quite really do that. There are so many, we need books that don't take a, a, a stance, but that get us inside. Yes. 
the mind. And don't take a stance. One of the ones I'll just recommend quickly before we turn to the question mics is Donald Antrim's one Tuesday in April this year about suicidal depression, um, such a great, great book. But um, with, we've got these two mics, so if you have a question, please come to one or the other, and I welcome you, and if you don't start asking questions, you just have to hear more from me, so please come up. <laughs> Thank you. Hi there. Oh, oh hello, I don't, oh, whoops. Is this You're is right. You, oh, yeah. okay. It was just throwing the sound. That's all. You made me think so much, so I don't want to be a nightmare in terms of too many words. But, um, we've had, we have conditions in the family that psychiatry labels. I also, in, in the late 80s and early 90s, I was a peon, a, a research assistant at a clinic that studied schizophrenia. And I, so I might be like this mentality that you're seeing the problems with, like, so I don't want to be like the old school that that's too much and that's done a lot of harm. But the director there, one thing he just observed in a paper was that he, he just felt like different cultures around the world that sometimes people with schizophrenia had an easier time on average feeling more valued and comfortable in certain cultures than others. They lent themselves to people feeling at home in the culture. Um, for the medicalizing, um, it's not that medicalizing might turn out to be wrong, absolutely. But it, then there's this thing about whether it's whether it's in an in infancy in medicine, and also whether, um, in addition to being in an infancy, whether it's in the sense of us not just understanding, like if you think about the humors turning into um, bacteria and things like that. It, there are some things that medicine could serve us, but it was where we were along what we understood. Uh, and then right now we've got a lot of chronic illness as, as big issues in our country. That's a lot of death occurs to chronic illness. And I think there's a parallel with psychiatric conditions and chronic illness and things where there is, where there's definitely an environment genetic interaction. And the stigma seems different with a lot of um, psychiatric condition or whatever you'd like to call them. Like even with, you mentioned diabetes. Well, we don't, you know, there's substance use conditions, but you don't hear that people with diabetes, which is type two is an interaction, at least between environment and genetics. You don't hear like a sugar addict really. I'm sorry to even say it. It's so offensive. I'm sorry to say sugar addict, but you hear, you know, like drug addict and stuff like that le leveled at people with and we have someone in the family who's bipolar and also had substance use conditions, and it's terribly complex. So, so I, I just think the stigma is different, and I'm not so quite sure. Is that why the we question? Can. Is Although, that, just some like things to, to throw out there. Would you like to ask the question closer yeah. to the mic? Oh, yeah. sure. I just wanted to move on if I should move on. But some of those things, and I'm just humbled by some things, like one example of being really humbled is that some people with what we characterized as having substance use conditions. There, this is individual and it's new and in its infancy, but Hopkins is, and other places have picked up some research that was sort of pushed down for a while about treating with hallucinogenics. Right. So they're seeing amazing results with, for people with substance use problems by turning them to substances that they used to associate with substance use problems. So I guess what I'm, what I'm just trying to say is maybe it's not medical or not, but maybe it's just far more complex than we ever, um, and we maybe we can't get a handle on it. Um, you talked about different body systems. The immune system, I found it interesting, is found to have so much uh, relationship with our brains and our minds that we didn't. That's true, to and um, thank you for your observations. I do want to get to more questions, and but do you have a specific question, to, or was it just these observations, ma'am? It was more that I was wondering um, if you saw maybe a middle road that there is medicine, but there's also other things. So religion I, would be an example. Yeah, you were I think saying that's... like if somebody is talking about namria, I worked in a clinic studying schizophrenia. But if you look at religion, we have in our world a whole array of religious beliefs where if 
if let's, you pick let's one, just go then a with bunch that. of others let's might have to Let's just go with that question. So how um, can is we it, put this all let, together? Let, yeah, let's, yeah, let's go with that and have you both answer, and then I know we have a gentleman over here with the question. So, Thank you. Thanks, and yes, complexity, and then, as Rachel said, humility should be just absolute starting points. Um, I'll try to sort of bring together your talking about the psilocybin or hallucinogenic research with a little bit of, of spiritual thinking. So it's interesting. There have been two large studies of hallucinogens and their effects on PTSD, depression, et cetera. Uh, I will say that my newspaper, the New York Times, heralded both as great successes. That was actually a mistake, so click on the clicks uh, in that big article that trumpeted this. One of them was a big success. The other one had no significant difference between it and the way we tend to treat uh, depression now. And the difference maker was that in the successful study, there was a lengthy, I believe it was 80 hours, don't quote me on that, but it was a lot of therapy, and it was therapy of very specific type. I've read the manual. It was about guiding the subject toward ideas of oneness, um, ideas of merging with one's surroundings, ideas of being part of something larger. I'm more or less quoting. And you can see where I'm going with this. It's, it's not the chemical on its own, though the chemical can help you get there. It's a, a different perspective um, that puts self in a different relationship to surroundings uh, that seems to have the beneficial effect. Thank you. That's what seems to be true. It's very early days. Sir? I, uh, maybe of all the medical specialties, psychiatry is the most culturally influenced. You pointed out there's many more times the number of schizophrenics among minority populations than white populations. I was misdiagnosed for 20 years with two or three different, you know, well-known psychiatric things. My parents said, no, you, you don't, well, and, and my family is still thinking the issue is me as opposed to my parents who drove me to act in the way that made me look like a psychiatric case. Um, how often does family drive the issues in an individual? I had a therapist or I had a psychiatrist whose mother's behavior towards his older brother caused his older brother to commit suicide. You know, if you wouldn't mind my jumping in yeah. for just a second, I just want to say uh, it's such a, a delicate balance with saying someone causes something. Well, right. okay. but, but no, 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 but, but, but fair enough. What I wanted to say is part of my book, which is the memoir's title is Life B, is about the genetic component of my mental illness because I'm not even sure how my parents decided to have children. Both sides of the family were so riddled with identifiable cases of mental illness, alcoholism, psychotic um, problems, um, everything you can think of. And it, it's, it, Threading that needle is, is so difficult, but it is something you can't ignore either. So I will turn it back to the actual authors. <laughs> I mean, I, I think it's just such a complicated, like I think there's a tendency to see it as it's a problem of the family or it's a problem of the brain. And I would just also say like first yes to both of those, but also like it could be a problem like of discrimination in your community or a problem of bullying at your school. I think, um, you know, there's a, there's a biological component and there's an environmental component and the family might be the environmental component. And I think to like pretend that either aspect isn't important is to, would not be truthful. Thank you. And um, do you want to respond or should we move on to the next question, Daniel? I think we have a, a lot of people who want to ask questions, so. Yeah, and Hi. thank you to all of you. All right, I just had a quick question about, um, so 
like with the sort of experience of mental illness being subjective, how do you approach um, writing about other people's experience with mental illness in the way that you know feels authentic and uh, fair to them? Right. Great so question. Thank you. It is a great, eternal, important, essential question. Um, assume I'm not going to get all the way there. Uh, spend a lot of time in the end with a very few people. So I'm not, I'm going to cast a wide net at the beginning, but at the end, I'm going to make choices so that I can get as deep as I can into someone else's consciousness and desires. And so that for me, my brother, for, you know, and there at least <laughs> we're dealing with same family, same, you know, lives, uh, Caroline, and then one uh, man who's a, just a wonderful crusading civil rights attorney who was beset with a kind of depression that made him question not only his capability, but whether he cared about the very work that he'd uh, long been so successful at. But really, the simple answer is time, listening, and then it goes back to humility. I try not to bring my own, too much of my own lens. Of course, of course, we're human beings. We're going to bring that lens. But I try to get that out of the way as much as possible. Can I add one? Yes, please. Um, I also felt like it was important. I wrote about people who had kept their own diaries, um, and a lot of them, I, I was able to f look at letters they, that they had written people, or even like um, poetry they had written, and then I also would talk to their families. So there was a way of like layering different levels of reflection on each other. Like the first was their, their diary in the moment of the crisis, and then the next would be like letters they wrote to friends after the crisis, and then years later, I'm talking to them and trying to incorporate like, their voice and sort of quote them. So there is a lot of their actual words throughout the book. So we have very little time. I'm gonna go here and then here, and then I think that's the, la the those are the last two questions, so please. Yeah. Um my family, we actually had three separate uh, mental health crises in just the last year. And I think one of the most <clears throat> pervasive feelings amongst, um, you know, all of us, lo the loved ones watching this is a sense of helplessness, right? How few public resources there are to, like, stop this individual from self-destructing, right? Um, unless they're actively, like, harming themselves or harming someone else, it is just a feeling of, like, we can't stop them. And so I guess my question is, um, what do you think we, could do at a national like policy level, or even even if at state levels, um, that we're not doing now, right? That the resources perhaps we could provide, if, if there was a a bill, right, that, that Congress could write tomorrow, what would what would you recommend be in it, um, and what resources do you think um, should be provided at a at a national level? Um, I just want to first recognize the inevitability of the feeling of helplessness. I want to go back to a word that came up earlier, terror. My family felt terror. My parents wanted to do nothing more than control this situation, right? Young 20s son who they're told will likely take his own life if he's not medicated. And we have the hospital records. I mean, this was not, this is a diagnosis my brother would contest very much but it's not a diagnosis that conventional psychiatry would find questionable at all. Similarly, Caroline, who, who you can read about. I would say what Caroline would say. When we're controlling, we're not connecting. And as much as you and your family want to control things, I would say you can't. And you're going to have to find a way to listen that is going to scare you to your depths and that that is your best hope. I actually distrust, I'm sure we should be spending more money and giving people more access to psychiatry, but I don't think policy is going to solve this one. I think we're going to have to be full of humility, and full of the willingness to connect even when it is beyond scary. 
I promised that you would get to ask your question and then I'm going to have to wrap it up. So please, um, but I am going to fulfill that promise and then wrap it up. <laughs> oh, thank you. Uh, I was going to ask a somewhat related question of in thinking about how we can support the people we love that are dealing with these types of um, challenges. Is it best to try to empathize and understand specifically the experiences and perceptions of their brain or just try to show compassion without delving into those feelings? Um, well, I liked Daniel's answer, but I would sort of touch on this, but I, I, something I was thinking about was like the word like non-judgmental. Like I do think um, to, re and I don't, and I think both of the things you said could encompass that, but like the idea of responding to someone without judgment, because I think it is like the, the edge of judgment or th that makes someone not want to share their experience or not reveal like the terrifying thoughts they're having or not like ask for help. So I th and, and so I think like that principle of just sort of like hearing someone without judging or sort of rushing to do something with the information can be powerful. Thank you. And so I would just want to say thank you to Rachel Aviv. And I would like to show strangers to our shelves, ourselves, excuse me, books. I'm little uh, strangers to ourselves. And The Mind and the Moon by Daniel Bergner. Thank you so much, both of you. Thank you. And I'm Beth Ann Patrick. Thanks for being here today.